Hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive into us here. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Christina Patterson and the barrister and futurist Andrew Eborn. Hey. So let's see what's on some of those front pa pages for you. Starting with the Sunday Telegraph reports on the end of a four day manhunt for terror suspect Daniel Khalif. He was arrested in Greenford earlier today. I'll escape, just watch me. The Daily Mirror reports the fugitive was bragging about his plan to escape prison before he did on Wednesday. Likewise, the Sunday Express covers the fugitive's arrest, saying he was carrying a sleeping bag and riding a bike when found. On the front page of the Sunday People, hell on earth, more than a thousand people dead as an earthquake rocks Morocco. The Observer reports on the former roles of the man who's due to succeed Dame Alison Rose as chief executive of NatWest, in particular his time working for the UK arm of a Saudi oil group. There is, however, no suggestion of any wrongdoing on his part. And the Sunday edition of The Star remarks on today's sweltering heat and forecasts one final day of the same tomorrow. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code uh, that's on your screen right now during the programme, you can check out those front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. Well, we are joined tonight by Christina Patterson and Andrew Eborn. Uh, good evening to good you. Good evening. Um, it has to be said, most of the front page is dominated by um, the uh, Daniel Khalif escape and recapture, an extraordinary story. Everyone's been following it blow by blow over the last few days. Um, uh, Christina, uh, the, the Sunday Express saying um, they caught him on on the canal in on a bike ride, and uh, he he was denying that it was him at that time. Well, he's hardly going to say. <laughs> yes, here this I am. Me. I'm dying to find you. I think. I mean, thank goodness he's been caught. They've obviously put enormous uh, amounts of uh, resource and a lot of people on on his trail. What is clear is that he had support because he had a bike, which he clearly didn't have when he left prison. He had clothes. Apparently, he had a cool bag full of lovely food. Well, we don't know if it was lovely, but it was presumably quite nice, carefully packed for him by we don't know who. So there will be other people involved in this story. What we don't know is how much any of this was set up in advance. We don't know who helped him in the prison. The thing that is overwhelmingly clear and anyone who knows anything about the prison system won't be surprised about this, is that prisons, and in particular Wandsworth, but generally prisons, are hugely under-resourced. They they've had such incredible cuts post-austerity, post the 2010 uh, George Osborne, David Cameron austerity drive. They lost, I think, about a third of their... Um, employees, a lot of the most experienced prison officers left. They, many of the people have been brought in are kind of 18-year-olds who get minimal training. And uh, so it's really not very surprising. It's shocking, but it's not surprising. And I, and I just hope that the thing that comes out of this is that the horrific state of our prisons is exposed so that we can't ignore this problem anymore because it has been ignored for decades. It, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a story that has forced everyone to focus on, on the politics around it, really, hasn't it? And, and, and in fact, in the mirror, Andrew, he, he says he, he bragged he'd do it. He certainly did. And, and, uh, he, clearly, he thought he could get away with it. Uh, absolutely. And it is interesting, and the sort of mindset uh, here is that we sort of make these sort of folk heroes, don't you? People who uh, escape. I mean, the last person famously escaping from Wandsworth was Ronnie Biggs all those years ago. Uh, on the 8th of July um, at 1965. And he obviously escaped for a long time. And he even bragged about how he helped somebody else escape in the same way as Khalif did. And so it is interesting. There's lots of questions to be answered, not least why it took an hour before the Met were made aware of it. Mm. But also in this country, we're one of the most surveyed people of all in the world. And there's over, it's been estimated, over 7 million CCTV 
cameras recording us about 70 times a day. In London alone, it's close to a million cameras. And normally, every time you use a credit card or, or a mobile phone, you can track those sort of things. They suspect that he probably didn't have those at this stage. But it seemed a bit strange that he was on his bike on, on a towpath. I mean, you would think he would go into hiding because the police themselves turn around and say, if they don't catch you within the first hour or so, it makes it incredibly difficult. Um, but extraordinary uh, situation, lots of questions to be asked. Uh, and, and let's see what's going to come out in the next few days. Yeah, and as we were saying, the state of uh, prisons has been highlighted, hasn't it? Uh, Prison Officers Association speaking earlier today and, and yesterday to Sky News highlighting that fact. And uh, the, the Telegraph on their front page saying that uh, he laughed when he was arrested. It's clearly become a cat and mouse game mm. for him mm. and something that he clearly thought he was very much capable of doing. Well, it was interesting because yesterday we had some of the family members coming out saying that he'd take, been captured very seriously and, and actually uh, it worried him a lot. There might be some mental health issues and so on and so forth. So a, a laugh can work in all sorts of ways that we've seen famously with politicians. It could be a nervous laugh mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. There are different ways of reporting these things. What we do know is there's been a massive rush to fill the vacuum of information. And people have speculated about everything. It's also important that at the moment, uh, he hasn't gone through the trial. He was only on remand. Yeah. He hasn't been found guilty. He's not a terrorist uh, uh, yet. Yeah, we, we don't really know much about him as a person exactly. or what exactly he's done. But all of that will come out. I think his trial's set for November. Um, but various other issues will come out, no doubt, in the next few days. But everybody's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, let's wait and see what the evidence suggests. Uh, but certainly it does raise those questions. Yeah, and, and if we talk a bit more, Christina, about uh, the fact that it raises the issues of the state of prisons, the fact that, you know, why was he even in Wandsworth? Why, some people are asking why was he not in Belmarsh, mm. I believe. And, but also, how, why did it take the police so long? But interestingly, the police are saying this is a celebration of how police and public can work together to, yeah. to capture people. Well, they obviously, to, to yeah. Uphold the law, at least. Well, the millions of cameras that uh, Andrew mentioned, yes. <laughs> which clearly are not terribly effective at solving crime, because, uh, as we know, an enormous number of uh, crimes are not being solved by the police, including pretty much every shoplifting incident mm. in the country at the moment, and that's been going Once. on for a long time. So we clearly can't... Uh, we can rely on cameras to catch us when we go two miles over the speed limit, but not necessarily in any other circumstances. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the bigger questions are that prisons are prison, prisoner factories. They are crime factories, basically. And the level, if anyone... I have been in prisons, and they are shocking, mm. really shocking. People, Most people wouldn't believe the condition that people are left in. And because they're so badly resourced and staffed, many prisoners are locked away for, you know, 23 hours a day. The chance that they will get any opportunity to get any kind of uh, rehabilitation, education that might support them into employment when they leave prison, that's for the birds. And it's a really primitive system. And it really makes me angry the way that our politicians, and particularly Tory politicians, are constantly talking about being tough on crime. Well, if you really want to be tough in crime, you should stop it. And the best way to stop it is to have proper rehabilitation and to support, you know, to reduce crime. We have exactly the opposite. We have crime factories in this country of in a really primitive way. They are squalid, they are full of drugs, they are full of weapons, they are just... I mean, you know, we should be profoundly ashamed of our prison system. But what will also happen, it will accelerate the conversation about how technology can help. So mm. I talk about uh, artificial intelligence around the world, and, and we look at that sort of side. Uh, the TikTok things you might remember on Oxford Street, a lot of that, mm. they talk about facial recognition, yeah. they could basically prevention being better than cure. What's, what's going to happen is going to accelerate that. And already on a minor offences, such as driving offences, they're picking up things with AI cameras, uh, now can show people holding their mobile phone and report that. So what's interesting is why it took so long to find him, bearing in mind the amount that he was being recorded all of that time. And clearly he wasn't hiding if he's on a bike on a towpath. Yeah, well, well we could probably have a, a, another entire debate show about how to handle these kind of situations, but we've got to move on. Um, another big story of the day, of course, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak mm. has been in India for the G20 summit. Also, of course, that great tagline of uh, India's son-in-law returning. He is, yeah. of course, of Indian <laughs> heritage. His wife is Indian. Um, 
The Express, page six and seven, talking about the Rwanda deal being up for discussion. Uh, the government, of course, clearly trying to say that this is a, a, a benchmark uh, uh, a benchmark plan and policy that others might follow. Well, it, it is interesting because, uh, and people have made the analogy, we've spent lots of resources stopping one man leaving the country. Uh, from September the 2nd, if I remember the statistics, there's 2,188 were coming in on the boats. Uh, illegally. Um, so it is a big issue and uh, Rishi is always going to be haunted by one of his five pledges uh, to, to stop the boat. So they need to find a sensible solution. Rwanda has turned into one of those sort of nasty words in, in, in a sense that it hasn't worked. And they talk about the huge amount of money that's been spent trying to make it work. But, but certainly we need a solution. It's, it's fine talking about it. Uh, but looking on that sort of basis, they need to come up and say, this is the deal, this is how we're going to cope with it uh, uh, accordingly and stop the boats in those ways. Because the real sympathy side goes out to those who are actually on those boats. It's the traffickers who we really need to target. Uh, and Christina, um, staying with uh, migration, um, apparently, according to The Telegraph, he's been discussing uh, migration with, of course, a, a very welcoming audience for that kind of discussion, uh, uh, Maloney, uh, the Italian yeah. Prime Minister. Yes, well, um, I mean, <laughs> given that she uh, is from the Brothers of Italy, which has its roots in Mussolini's fascism, I'm not sure that this is really uh, the kind of... Uh, partnership, political partnership that Rishi Sunak should be seen to be fostering. It's one thing to ally yourself with a sort of conservative governments across Europe, but to particularly pick Georgia Maloney, who, you know, has appeared, uh, has in many ways appeared to be slightly more moderate than people might have feared uh, since she took over in Italy. But um, Italy's problems with migration are much, much, much bigger than ours. If you, you know, the, the numbers of boats that come into both Sicily and uh, the south of Italy, uh, and obviously Africa is much nearer, um, the scale of it, it's, on a, it's just completely on a different scale. And if you go to Rome, you see hundreds, thousands of young men sleeping rough in the parks. So... The fact is, I, of course, I think that there is an issue here. And uh, as Andrew says, our hearts go out to all those who yeah. come over on the boats. Because let's be clear, these are not people trying to buck a system. I mean, in one sense, they might be because they are not necessarily all genuine asylum seekers. But they are all escaping from a life they perceive to be unbearable or extremely difficult to a life they hope will be better and I think most of us given the opportunity would probably do the same thing whether that is fair to the British taxpayer is is in a whole other question and it does depend on a model of criminal people smuggling which mm. is utterly immoral amoral and cruel and exploitative and ruthless so of course we must smash that model but to pretend as politicians do that these are easy questions to solve is utterly ridiculous many many Many, many of millions of people outside Western Europe would love to have a tiny taste of the luxury that we enjoy in our lives every day. Nobody can blame them for wanting to come here. It is extremely hard to police all the borders of an island like the UK, and we can't pretend this is an easy problem to solve. And, and you know, we can pay African countries to, you know, take the people we don't want. Whether that will work or not, I don't particularly approve of it as an idea, but well, we can't of course, also... the argument is to, to provide safe routes where to we can actually routes, process fine, people fine, in but a it, correct but as manner. Always, yeah. as always, frankly, it's a case of abnegating our problems to poorer countries, and I don't really approve of that approach to things, but it's not going to solve the problem. No, and you're absolutely right. We do have to make sure that you address the fair ones, who are, and not everybody's coming here for because they've got hardships in their own country. There are some people who are abusing the system, not least the criminal gangs who are bringing people over. We need to address it on all sorts of things. It's you're not right. being properly addressed at the moment. We can agree on that. Yeah, F fairness is the word there, isn't it? OK, we're going to just uh, take a quick break, but coming up... For the first time in a long time, Prince Harry gets some good publicity. We'll discuss that next. Stay tuned. You're watching the press preview. With me tonight is Christina Patterson and Andrew Eborn, and we've been taking you through the front pages. Um, so, of course, uh, another big uh, story today. Prince Harry taking oh. the stage at the Invictus Games again. I know, look, 
all smiles all round, yeah. isn't it? It's wonderful. Um, Andrew, uh, it, this right, is something that is something good. that he can really showcase that's good. And we can all feel good about it. And, and at long last, there's a great story about Harry because he's dominated the mm. publicity for the last several things about Spare and the row that he has with his brother and so on and so forth. So it's great. Invictus Games started in 2014 for injured soldiers and so on and so forth with the great motto, I am. So a bit of a mm. Gloria Gaynor there, making people feel good. And what I love about it is totally empowering. He was so in his element today, getting out there, talking German as well. And the crowd just loved him so all praise for Harry I think taking a good story about that sort of side is great and it, the other thing he also does is talk about people who are injured not just physically but mental health as well mm. and I think any time that somebody in the public eye is talking about their own demons and so on and so forth has got to be helpful it's so important actually and I'm really pleased you raised that because also him being a man yeah. and a high profile man raising that on a global stage is really important and Christina of course we are also expecting Megan to turn up mm. at some point and he he, he joked about her uh, finding out about some kind of Nigerian heritage too, and so <laughs> they're going to have uh, that kind of battle between Nigeria and Great Britain. So, yeah, good to see him back on stage in his element. Absolutely. But, you know, I have to say, and I think the Invictus Games are fantastic, and I think, I think he is... This is what he should do, because he has a very... I think he has a very soft heart and he really does you know when he's been in Africa when he's done his charity work when he's doing this kind of thing he is absolutely at his best when you know he is less at his best is when he's talking about himself and his own suffering and uh, or perceived suffering and I think please Harry can you stick to this stuff in future because and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what you say about mental health of course mm. I absolutely agree that to talk about, you know, he went through a terrible tragedy in losing his mother when he was just a child with the eyes of the world on him and that was an incredibly difficult thing for him to go through. But I think when he focuses on other people, he's great. When he focuses on himself and his own grievances, rather less so. So okay. can we have more of this, Harry, please? <laughs> OK, we're going to have to move on um, and uh, talk about... Uh... The heat wave. Phew, what a scorcher. Absolutely. Look at it. It's right there in all its glory. In case you missed it, 33.2. I love it, love degrees. it. Love You're it, loving love it. it? Oh, I love it. Yeah, bring it on. Yeah. I mean, obviously, not bring on global warming and planetary disaster and the end yeah, of the world. Yeah, that, that's but, the but, dichotomy but, in the yes. discussion, isn't it? You might want to enjoy the hot weather, but you've got to remember where it's coming from. Yeah, well, um, I don't know. I mean, the, the whole sort of thing 92 degrees in, in old money. It's not the hottest it's ever been because that was, uh, I think, last year, 19th of mm. July, uh, when it reached. 40.3 degrees centigrade, which was uh, 104 in Coningsbury, Lincolnshire. So yeah. scorching on that sort of basis. People are enjoying it. I was wandering out today and there's a wonderful feeling. Good weather brings out the best in people, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone smiles. We all but smile. Well, so in England, you're always so pathetically grateful when the sun comes <laughs> out that you just can't stop smiling. Well, it should be grateful. I think a lot of us complain as well about it when it happens. Yeah. But also, I mean, there is apparently one more day of this, but there's yes. also a risk of flash flooding happening. Thunderstorms and well, that of course, sort of that stuff. Of being have blighty. To come, but, you know, Plague of locusts so coming lovely. along as well. I mean, so it's always that sort of thing. I mean, the British love to talk about the weather, but now we're having some, some of the best days of all. We'll just enjoy it. I think the reality is, of course, it's got to rain. That's why we got such a green and pleasant land. It's going to rain a lot. Um, but I think that sort of principle, let's get more of the sun uh, and enjoy it while we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more day to enjoy it. What are you going to be doing tomorrow, Christina? Uh, sitting in the garden with a nice glass of rosé. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing? I'm flying to Vilnius. I'm going to Lithuania. Oh, how lovely. Um, to fly the British flag over there and see glorious old places. Uh, I, I try to visit places which are more decrepit than I am. So <laughs> <laughs> it should be good. OK. Right, thanks so much. Andrew Eborn and Christina Patterson, thank you.